morning. Welcome to the second webinar in our series, Understanding Complex Needs. I'm Diane Newfield from NYCCP, standing in for Ruth Colon Wagner, who's unable to join us this morning. With me have Christy Angione, Clinical Director at New York Care Coordination Program. And we have our presenter, Doug Hurlbut, uh, who Chris will be um, introducing in a little while. So I think we're all on mute now. Uh, we have our partners that I want to welcome as well. We have from the Center for Practice Innovations, Paul Margulies and Nancy Kovo. From the Coalition of Behavioral Health Agencies, we have Laura Ladner. And on the New York State Council for Community Behavioral Health Care, we have Cindy Levernoy. Welcome, everyone. So questions may be submitted using the on-screen question box, and we will answer your questions in an email. If we have time at the end, we will answer the questions. If we run out of time, we will send all the responses in, in an email. We also ask that if you're joining the webinar as a group, that you complete the post-event survey. There's a way that will pop up at the end of the presentation, and we ask that you submit the names and email addresses of all those who watched the presentation together. This will ensure that you'll receive credit for attending and you'll have access to all the materials and the Q&A responses. want to remind you that our coming Supervisor Learning Collaborative Call will be on June 7th and have the region calls on June 28th for Region 4, uh, June 29th for Region 5, and July 1st for the Long Island region. I will now turn you over to Christine Mangione, who will introduce our presenter. Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Doug Hurlbut. Doug is a licensed clinical social worker with over 20 years of experience serving and leading in multiple clinical settings. Doug has applied the principles and tenets of the trans-theoretical model person-centered philosophy and cognitive behavioral theory throughout his career in a variety of settings in service of clients and families with a variety of challenges. Later in his career, Doug was introduced to the work of David Rock and the increasing knowledge base on neuroscience and its application to leadership and coaching. The SARF model became another tool that Doug used to engage persons that he served in the recovery process. After spending almost three years applying the knowledge and skills learned working in the behavioral health field to leadership development and coaching, he is now working with the New York State DISRIP Initiative, leading projects on community crisis stabilization in the integration of primary care and behavioral health. This taught and led system initiatives on person-centered treatment planning, crisis intervention, integration of mental health and substance use disorders, and is presented extensively on the stages of change, change management, and other leadership topics. Today, Doug will be sharing some tools with you that will assist with engagement and retention for the complex needs population and discuss both what's important to the individual being served as well as what's important for that person. So without uh, any delay, I'm going to let Doug take over. Thank you, Christine. Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you here today. It's beautiful weather here. I hope it is wherever you are as well. Uh, so today the topic is uh, understanding complex needs. Uh, when first asked um, if I could put something together on this, I was very excited, first of all. But second of all, I thought, well, that's, that's quite a daunting uh, task. I mean, uh, I've worked with folks, and I'm sure you all have, who have multiple needs, and uh, it's never as straightforward as we think. And um, the complexity and interaction of all of these challenges that people face makes it um, each day uh, quite challenging and difficult. So that led me to think, okay, well, you know, what would be an approach that might be helpful and what, is, what has helped me? And one of the things that's helped me is I kind of go back to what kind of things I have control over. And because there's so many things that um, throughout the day I feel like I don't. Um, that led me to um, go back to what I know. Uh, and some of that is the cognitive behavioral theory, uh, ther theory and therapy, but also the stages of change. And what do I know about how people change? 
and what we can do to help them. And then the words that I use, which is one of the tools, right, when we're intervening that is most accessible to me, how is it the words, how do I use those words to be most effective? Because I have control over that. That led me to kind of put these material together for you today. So hopefully you'll find it as useful as I have throughout my practice and my interactions with, with both folks that I've served either um, in, in behavioral health or leaders or working with uh, multiple groups with multiple uh, stakeholders who have different needs and sometimes those don't always align. So some of these skills I've found have come in um, handy. So look at what we're going to try to accomplish today. So the objectives for today are to learn what interventions are most likely to be effective given where the person is and their level of readiness to change. Understand how the words that we use can affect the engagement of individuals in reaching their health goals. And use tools that we're going to provide today to plan for and deliver the interventions based on um, content. So uh, some of the supporting materials, I understand you, you, you may have gotten an email this morning and some you'll get at the conclusion. Um, but hopefully if you've uh, received the worksheet uh, one and one A, which are the personal changes worksheet and worksheet two, positive influence. If you're able to access those, it would be a good time to kind of get those in front of you because we'll be using those. Um, Handouts of supporting materials will be on SCAR and the processes of change, just um, sort of a handy um, sheet of reference uh, post webinar if, uh, as you begin to apply some of the this. Um, and sort of, I didn't want this material to be too abstract and um, uh, perhaps just me, but one of the ways that I learn about things is by trying to understand um, how they apply to me in my experience, which is going to be very similar to the people that I'm working with. I mean, we're all Things and we all have similar experience of things, not exactly the same, but we do experience change, for example. All of us experience change. There might be something that I can learn from that experience um, that would make it uh, helpful for me as I work with people. So today I wanted to have, um, encourage you to have that same sort of learning experience. So whenever you're intervening with someone, one resource that's always available to you is, is you. So if we um, start how we would understand others, especially others with complex needs, it starts with understanding ourselves. Learn about ourselves and take that with us and use it in these encounters with folks that have very complicated lives with multiple challenges and challenges that brought them to our doors, quite frankly. The essence of their experience of change is not too different than our experience of change. Therefore, it be with, worthwhile it seemed to me to understand how change happens on a human level. The better we understand and can relate um, to the experience of those we serve, the better outcomes are likely to be. Is that? Well, think about it. I mean, who wants a care manager who's not able to understand or relate at all to the person's experience? Do you think um, that the people you serve um, will really listen to someone that they think can't begin to understand them? What would that relationship be like? Does this mean um, that you have to have experienced everything that the people you serve have? No, but it's certainly um, you've experienced changes big and small, big and small, and you've challenged with those, had challenges with those as well. So what can you learn from that that you can um, make you sensitive and understanding what the folks you're working with? So that leads us to our first worksheet. So um, worksheet one. What I'd like you to do, if you have it, and I can pull it up here, right? Yeah, let's pull it up. So it should look like this. And see, on uh, the left-hand column, um, it asks you to answer the question, what change that you Either made 
this is a behavior that um, has become what you would consider a habit. You don't have to think about it. Uh, you're in the process of doing. It's not quite yet a habit. It be new to you. Thinking in a new way most of the time. Uh, that you're planning to make. You've decided that you want to make a change, but have not fully begun to make the change yet. You're thinking about, you're considering it, kind of weighing the pros and cons, but you haven't fully committed yet. You've been told that you make. <laughs> this is the change maybe that you did not consider, or someone else thinks you should make, or, you know, the environment is sort of telling you, you know, this is something that, uh, this is a new world for you now, and um, you have to adjust. What might be a change uh, for you that is in that? Um, in that box. So what I'd like you to do is just take a couple minutes down that, through these and see if you can identify something in your life right now that falls into any of these categories. So just make a quick note. You don't have to write a lot, just a key word that will trigger you um, to think about that change. One of the things that we want to do throughout this webinar is to have you applying this stuff um, as we go through. And this is one way to do that. If you can relate to it, um, then you can you have an example in your head that you can work this stuff through with. So um, take a minute and identify that with a keyword. Okay, thanks for doing that. Um, so a couple examples, um, and I don't, I don't think I have the, do I have the example sheet here? Sorry. So, yeah. So that in a second. Uh, why don't we just stay there for a second, just to kind of go through the examples. Uh, three we haven't done yet, don't worry about that. But for me, example, a uh, change that I've made is around exercise and how that's incorporated into my life now. Certainly was a time when it wasn't, <laughs> where I had lots of reasons why it wasn't, but uh, it's uh, become uh, a habit, something that I don't even think about. It's a part of my routine. Something for me that I'm planning to make is, is buying a new house. So um, something that, that planning stage, have taken um, like some action, but it's certainly not at the point where we're uh, definitely uh, closing on a house or anything um, permanent like that, but um, have taken steps. For so examples for me, hopefully we're able to come up with a uh, few for yourself. So head to that sheet, as you can see, as you got a sneak preview of, quite unintentionally, but uh, we'll be adding to the column three in a, in a little bit once we understand a little bit more about um, the stages of change. Okay, so um, things about change is we have this perception, many of us, um, for ourselves, but also perhaps folks we're working with that success tends to be this linear process. You know, we, we were... Uh, one way or had one um, um, sort of set of habits in our life, and then boom, we just went straight line right to where we are today. Um, and I think about, uh, when I think about it, and I'm sure when you do, when you reflect that um, 
it doesn't go that way, does it? It more looks like what's on the right. So that often involves a lot of starts and stops. You might have given up, changed your mind. Perhaps you thought you had made a change, only realized that you've fallen back into old habits. Sorry that it wasn't smooth, easy, or simple as it was or might be. I think one of the things to keep in mind, maybe one of the key things to keep in mind about change is that it, it does look like what's on the right. So if you're working with someone who is um, had a difficult time and you may even be frustrated, um, then I think it's good to remember that if it looks like what's on the right, it's probably going the way that it should. <laughs> if it's going way on the left, then I would actually be concerned. Um, because it's going a little too well, and it usually doesn't go that way. So you're going to have this mess in the middle, and it's okay. Just uh, not a pro uh, is a process, not an event, as we know. The role of the, of the care manager is to be, uh, you know, skilled in facilitating the process of behavior change. Right? I mean, that's why you exist. Art for people you serve is to help facilitate this process. We all know that change happens, and change happens on its own, quite frankly. But your goal is how do we facilitate that in a way that you can your knowledge, your resources, the compassion you have, the skill to that relationship. Um, the individual can look to you for guidance, support, practical advice, and help. I mean, you have the expert knowledge of the systems and entitlements, as well as how to get things done. If not all of you have probably built relationships that you can access to help those that you serve meet their needs. You've built connections with other um, service providers and support. So today's webinar really is to help you engage folks in this process of change. Very skillfully do all that is needed for the people you serve. You could fill out the paperwork, you could, you know, make all the connections for them, you could Whatever their needs are, you could probably meet them because you probably have skills in that area. But not necessarily your role. Your role is um, to achieve what their life goals are, and, and they have to achieve them. In fact, doing all this stuff for folks actually probably disengages them from their life goals. Think about some of your proudest accomplishments, for example. When you look back in your life or think about your career, what means the most to you? Was it something someone did for you? My guess is that it was a challenge that you faced, probably one that required you to stretch beyond what you were comfortable with or thought was possible. What made you want to do that? Was there someone that helped you with that? They do. This is a gift that you could give to the people you serve. The gift of being able to look back on their lives and feel good, proud, confident about accomplishing something important, a life goal, be a challenge that was important to them. So today, we're going to dive a little deeper into how, as your, as their manager, you can get your clients, or, sorry, or people you serve, into to the game. Because if they are not, they are missing out on something that truly matters. We will understand how you can more skillfully help people toward what matters to them by just having them realize what matters to them all the way to supporting the changes that they have made to make a difference in their lives. So that's really why we're doing this. So we're talking a little about stages of change. I know people are probably pretty familiar with this. It's been around for a while, so we won't spend a lot of time here, but I just want to make sure we're oriented to it because it, it something we're going to build on in terms of our interventions with our case example. One of the things we refer to in the, in the sort of the about how change happens, it's not a linear straight process. Stages of change tend to be um, a circular process or a more like probably that drawing we saw before on the right where it just gets a little bit like crazy town there where you're kind of all over the place. So let's talk about what the stages of change are. So you're probably familiar with these, but just as a review, pre-contemplation. So this person is type <laughs> slim, probably not. They might not be themselves accurately. So here, folks are uh, 
really intending to change or may not be aware of a need to change. Some key things about pre-contemplation that uh, made a lot of sense to me uh, when I first um, learned about it was that it's not always that they're unaware of change, it's that maybe there's been so many previous attempts to at change that they've, it's, they've kind of given up in a sense. So it looks like they don't think they need to change, but it's really it not be that as much as they just don't, they feel kind of hopeless about it. So calculation, the point where we're making about uh, whether we need to make a decision about making a change. So have some awareness that something needs to happen. You can see kind of, hey, if I don't do something here, What's the risk of that? What are the consequences of that? See that maybe you know um, what we're doing is not the best for us. Okay, what are the pros and cons? What's good about making this change? We may express that. Hey, you know, I'm thinking I need to change, especially maybe after an adverse event of some sort. But the person is still clearly ambivalent about whether they want to actually do anything about it at this point but there is some intention there. Nation. This is interesting. Uh, I always thought this was an interesting stage. Um, it's one that um, actually is quite critical um, to sustaining change as, uh, efforts, I believe. And you can get, sometimes people will get motivated, especially by an event, something happening where they realize, <clears throat> you know, quote, well, something needs to change. And I want to go right into whatever that change is. Just, you know, right, that's it. I'm going to start exercising tomorrow. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to stop going around those people. I'm going to whatever. It's just it. It's like cold turkey. It's like, uh, you know, just stop. And that usually, not usually, well, a lot of times that doesn't work so well. And because we haven't gone through this stage, so they've taken action prematurely. So part in getting a prep, uh, preparing for change is, Sure, the person actually believes that this is possible. Built maybe some successful attempts in the past. Have they done anything, uh, any pro, sort of pro health behaviors, uh, whether it be exercise, being around the right people, maybe um, getting the positive supports in their life? They're expressing an interest in that change. Clear now, you can hear them. They see the benefits. They can see that there are benefits to this change, and that they're building towards taking action and. 30 days or so. That's just that's Tresca's sort of definition of it. But um, this is a person that's intending taking action. This is someone that you might you know, jump to action. You might feel that you need to kind of pull them back a little bit and let's really think about this without sort of hindering their motivation. You want that, but you want to make sure, sure they're ready so that they can be successful or else. So in pre-contemplation, pre this could be yet another failed attempt just going to push them further back in their state of change, perhaps, if we uh, don't take care and pay attention to the state. just want to make a special note of that. So action stage. So we move from the point where we feel like we're ready, we're motivated, we have an idea of what we're going to do, to actually doing something. So people, the person has begun to make this change, they're going to make the change consistent. It's not just an emotional reaction. We have things in place. They understand it sort of intellectually. They have, uh, um, you'll see with the processes of change, there's some things to help them with the behavior. And emotionally, they maintain their motivation. Commitment to change, plan developed, and over change less than six. So this is someone who's new into change. I'm not sure why this is a maintenance slide. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, I just love the, the confidence of that cat. And maintenance <laughs> is about confidence. It's about feeling like you got it. This guy or girl or have it, right? Yeah. So it's practiced consistently for more than six months. It's become a habit, and you express confidence in your ability to continue the change. So you feel like you've got this, and you can continue to do this. Maintenance can look like that. Okay, so those are sort of stages of change. Quick review of those. I want to talk a little bit about the processes of change because we'll be using these processes 
um, to, to understand you and how you change, but also in our interventions. So try not to get necessary, uh, hung up on the, um, the names as we go through them, but it's more important just to see what, what they are. So what the processes, processes of change or process of change? For traffic decrementing, define that as any activity that you initiate to help modify your thinking, your feeling, or your behavior. So those are the three domains that um, when we think about change that to uh, address and make sure that you are paying attention to. Four processes of change. So, consciousness raising, um, becoming more aware of a problem with potential solutions, dramatic relief, emotional arousal such as fear about failure to change or inspiration for change, personal change. I mean, dramatic relief is something that you will see used quite a bit. Um, this really grabs people's attention. Um, there's one example, that, I mean, this is how well it worked, it always comes to mind for me, is um, so awesome commercial with the dogs and the, I mean, it's just, right? I can't even look at it. I hear it come on. Now I hear that song, which I used to like, by the way, and now I can't even listen to the song because it's associated with that. I'm right there with you. Yeah. So this is, that's example, one example, but there's several of, of sort of emotional arousal to get you inspired to do something about it. For other folks, it could be, you know, an event that happens in their life that, you know, is that uh, last straw, so to Reevaluation, appreciating that the change is important to your identity, happiness, and success. So this is important to you. Salvation, this is believing that you can do it. This is having hope and making a commitment to it. Environmental reevaluation is appreciating the, the impact that it will have on others. So the change isn't just going to impact you, most likely. It's going to impact those around you, and you can understand and see how that would be beneficial or have a positive influence on that. And then reinforcement management, which is, you know, sort of the, the, um, the reasons that keep us on track or encourage new behavior. It's finding those things that are both can be in the environment and that we internally help. So it, it, this is, you're probably thinking it's strange, but that's okay. You can't see me. You may you know, know who I am, so I can disclose these things to an anonymous group. But, uh, so my exercise, one of the ways I got to exercise myself, I reward, reward myself with, um, ironically, food. Um, but there's certain foods that I really, there's certain foods that are, you know, go to foods for me important. So I would not, I would allow myself to have that until I exercise. Be like a treat, if you will. And that worked really well for me. So I, as I'm exercising, myself motivated to exercise, actually, I can, that reward is what got me going at first. So I my day around a chat. And then rewarding myself. So, kind of, uh, I'm just saying, but the folks you work with, it's what and it, you know what works for them. So for me, it might have been a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but for other folks, it could be other things. It could be, you know, the connection with you could be one thing, for example. But what are the other rewards? What's important to them? We all need that motivation when things, especially working with folks that have very complex needs that have multiple challenges the North Star for them. Um, they may have, you know, a picture of loved ones on your desk, for example, or other pets or other important things to you. Um, work gets tough, you know, kind of reminds us of why we're doing this, you know. Okay, how about that? Conditioning, substituting new behaviors and cognitions for the old ways of working. So this is, uh, you know, not only doing new things, but thinking in new ways. So part of, you know, um, moving through these stages of change is beginning to think about things differently, beginning to see things differently. The way you thought about things in the past has to change. This is part of that process. Helping relationships, support to do things. So it's seeking and using those, identifying what are those supports that can help us to facilitate and support the changes we want to make. This control 
the restructuring environment to elicit new behaviors and inhibit old ones. So, you know, for example, making sure that you have, uh, I just make it easy with exercise, for example, make sure that the stuff you have is set out. Maybe your sneakers are beside your bed, so you get up in the morning and there it is. You can't escape it, it kind of reminds you this is something you need to do. You will act, we all will act habitually without thinking at times. I'm sure you all found yourself doing something and thinking, why am I doing this? I didn't mean to do this. This happens. Unless we have some things, especially things that are very habitual for us, our environment to kind of cue us to do something different, it's very easy to just kind of go automatically fall into these things around stimulus control. And social liberation, it's empowering folks who are giving them more choices and resources. So I do want folks to feel like they have choice um, in how they're going to go about this change and have the resources and support to do that. It's very difficult to feel hopeful and motivated when you don't have those things in place. So that's kind of a review somewhat familiar to you. What is important is understanding what they are is when do you use them. So here, you know, you have these 10, it's like, well, when should I emphasize, you know, reinforcement management, for example? If you understand kind of the, the person that you're working with, you are, then you kind of know what to be talking with them about or having them sort of um, begin doing for themselves. So I noticed in contemplation and contemplation and up through kind of preparation into action, you see consciousness raising, dramatic relief, mental reevaluation, self, et cetera. And then we get to action maintenance, reinforcement management, helping relationships, et cetera. What I think uh, is, is, uh, jumps out at me and hopefully jumps out at you is what is different between those processes of change? About it, the ones in early on are about emotion, right? They're about imagining. They're about, you know, um, cultivating belief and confidence. It's not about doing anything necessarily. It's about those sorts of things. It's building on a person kind of ready to do something that they can sustain, making sure they're prepared. It's beginning to imagine that things could be different. And they got there. And then once you get to the person that's starting to actually do things, or when you are starting to actually do things, those reinforcement management to kind of get you to do it and to keep doing it, those sort of relationships become very important. Things that are going to help you to stay on track, controlling the stimulus so that you um, are reminded of, you know, whatever changes you're going to make. So it becomes much more sort of behavioral and supportive as you move through. Find that these these processes of change were things that um, you know for Pascal and Clement, they found that people kind of did. I mean, they didn't make these up and say, "Hey, this is what we think should work for folks." These are things that people were doing either sort of naturally or that they that they found helpful when they were making a change, and they were able to sort of see how these fell into those sort of categories. So within that, you see that folks, this is what people do. They get names like this, but, but it's just stuff people do to help change. Managers or as helpers or as folks that are they're, they're partnering with folks to help them achieve something. This is where us being skilled, eligible, comes into play. We have an understanding of this and how to use this stuff to help people. See, now we're not just a friend, we're not just someone coming alongside necessarily, we're coming alongside with some knowledge base and skill that we can help that person go through this process. All right, and then there's the, do we have, we don't have a handout, but, all right, we'll just, <laughs> oh, it's here, I'm sorry. Sorry, folks, I keep forgetting I have these handouts right here. Getting this after the webinar, right? right? Okay. So this is just another tool to kind of help pull this together a little bit for you in a little bit more plain language, I think. 
But as you, um, or you're helping someone moving through stages of change, these are some of the things that can kind of keep you stuck or hold you back from moving forward. And these are some things that can help you move forward. So I'm not going to go through all this. I just want to highlight just a couple just so you can see what's on the form here. So um, we talked about this in pre-contemplation. So failed attempts. So not necessarily protect people from failing, but we want to understand that, that failed attempts can help people back into this uh, stage of change. What can help someone move forward is this increasing uh, belief that they can do it, the self-efficacy and belief in oneself. You can be key in that. You can rally others in their life to help them sort of be key in that for the person. No, everyone has had some success in their life at something. Everybody. And um, so again, we talked about preparation as being important. So preparation is that commitment, setting a date to start, it's telling others of your plans, it's making sort of that social, uh, I wouldn't call it a contract necessarily, but cer certainly you're making folks aware accountability is built in to, hey, you know, I, I'm going to do this, start talking about it. That will build confidence. And then uh, finally, just kind of moving on here, in the act, um, main stage, so focusing on refinement, mastery, and awareness. So there, there's a, there's a, 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 a risk, I should say. Uh, when you're in maintenance, that you that doesn't mean that you're done. That you can you not lick forever. You know, you can fall back. So the things is to think about. Yeah, you've made this change. How can I sort of within this change maybe build on it a little bit? Is there a way to refine this? Is there a way to um, um, increase my mastery of what I'm doing? So that there's still some challenge in there. Still some feeling of growth, even though you've made a change. If you've plateaued and it becomes boring in a sense for you, that it's just, uh, you know, then then the more risk, I think, for falling back. So it's something to keep in mind. Again, as you're thinking about working with people and you identify what stage of change they're in, something that uh, could be helpful to guide how you're acting with folks and what things you might be um, focusing on or to have them focus on. Back to worksheet one. Take a couple minutes here. And you uh, notice when I uh, got to um, pulled up the original worksheet. Uh, column three. Now, what I want you to think about here is what are some of the processes of change for the change you've identified that you either use or are using. To change. Well, for me, I mentioned the reinforcement management around exercise. What I didn't mention was this help. I have a helping relationship, so there's someone that kind of keeps me on track. And I find how I feel after, not the results. So another thing about a sort of I would consider sort of a maintenance stage change. Focusing on not necessarily always results, but, but you know, how does it make you feel? afterwards for me works. So I feel better, I feel like I've accomplished something. Um, that's also I would add here around challenging for me, you know, trying new things within that that challenge me, make me feel like I'm uh, sort of starting over in a way with exercise helps for me. And then around the house, for me it was this image of being more content that it'll have in my environment environment more to my liking and um, I've been researching options and then you know setting a date kind of you know getting me moving on this and uh, that helped to kind of get me more into the action um, and preparation stage than um, just kind of thinking about it so a moment and identify a few for yourself and we will uh, continue with um, webinar
Uh, hopefully, you can get, you can come back to that too. I, you know, I do encourage you. I know it's uh, it's tempting to not kind of fill in these worksheets. I might not if I were you. I don't know, but um, I encourage you to kind of work through some of this if you haven't already in some way. But kind of work through this and connect to this idea of change and what helps and I find stages of change for yourself. I think it really is um, helpful in when you're uh, with folks to really understand this. It's difficult in a webinar because you can't interact with people. Um, you can't kind of go through this as a group. Um, so uh, any work you can kind of do on your own with this, I think is helpful. Oh, quickly, uh, the relationship, I didn't want to, talk about any of these things without talking about the relationship and how important it is. Um, so the work, work I gave you two, we don't, you don't have to fill it out, but maybe just think for now. You can fill it out later, but uh, you know, the relationship is foundational to the change process. People, as I mentioned um, toward the uh, beginning of the webinar, people are more likely to listen to with folks uh, that they have a good relationship or positive relationship with, they feel, you know, that they um, have, can understand them. So foundational, foundational is process. If you don't have those sorts of things, it's very difficult to kind of uh, intervene. So interventions that facilitate change also build relationships that influence. If you are using the stages of change and you understand how this works, you're meeting people where they're at. You're kind of tailoring how you're interacting with them um, to what their needs are. And they're, feeling, they're going to feel that, and that's going to help your relationship with them. Think about someone that you had that has an influence with you in a positive way, help you with your changes, perhaps. What were those characteristics? What was it that made them influential? So the things that people typically identify, that they cared about me. So there's a sense that the person actually cared. Their goal. Again, be someone where they're at is kind of a reflection of listening to someone. Nodding their head, but responding in a way that says, you know, I understand where you are in your life right now. They have knowledge. You know, folks are connecting with you, they you know, they need you for something, or they don't know they need you, but you have something to offer. You know, something to contribute to the relationship. Being knowledgeable about change, for example, sources, etc., is something that will help you to build that relationship. They don't judge. A person can uh, not feel judged by you, by their choice, you know, the choices that they make. They feel they can Share that stuff with you. Well understood. So I, we probably all have folks in our life that influence us, but also hold us accountable somewhat. It wasn't all just, hey, you're wonderful, you're great, do what you want kind of thing. It was, you know, I care enough about you that I don't see you move forward and I'm going to have some accountability. Different warmth and connection to the person. This belt. All of those things kind of lead to building a trusting relationship. These are some of the characteristics that I'm sure you identified uh, that can help promote influence. Because that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to kind of help influence people to make choices and do things that are going to help them achieve their goals. We can form, we're not, we can't make them. We have some influence. So I want to talk about SCARF a little bit. So SCARF was something that um, I met, as was mentioned, Christine mentioned in the introduction, something I came through a little bit later in my career. Some of this research, as, as you know, there's a lot, an awful lot of research. We're learning an awful lot about the brain and how it where influences our behavior. This was an example of that. Um, so um, one of the things I noticed in working with clients was I felt like I may have 
mm -hmm. what interventions, kind of met people where they were at, but it wasn't always working. Somehow people were still upset with me <laughs> when I was trying to help them. Like, why, are you, why are you upset with me? You know, I'm trying to do the right thing. Um, these folks, they were a challenge on multiple levels. And uh, yeah, but I noticed that, that that it was kind of still difficult to engage people, even though I, I thought I knew what I was doing. And I know that there was times where I'd be working in a, in a group or I'm working with an individual that when they were all in this place where everybody's like, yeah, feeling positive and great, and we things were just were everybody's so creative, and it seemed like we really made progress. And then there were times when it's just, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. We just had this great thing, and now we're in this other place where we can't even seem to find our way out of, you know, paper bag, so to speak. What could it be about? What is? I don't understand that. So, when I kind of searched and learned more about SCARF, it kind of led me to understand um, that there might be some things in the in the way that I was delivering intervention that could be helpful in terms of engaging people. So, the things that feedback I would get, I would say, I don't understand how this, you know, why this didn't free you or what. And you know, some of the feedback is, well. It's if you said it, or it's kind of when you said this, when you said that it would be best if I did this, or you know, what do you, what do you think about that? Um, that didn't work work for me too well. <clears throat> so one of the things that I struggled with, you know, personally around scarf, was certainty. Into that, but it was I was a little too open with people. I, I they felt a little scared around me, quite frankly, because feel like I um, provided enough sort of certainty around what was going to happen. I didn't have enough information about things, so they felt like what they, they knew what they could expect. And that created what you'll see as some disengagement. I, I didn't know. I thought I was being a little more person-centered, for example. I needed um, to be person-centered in a way that provided some certainty for folks. So that's what, what SCARF kind of came in for me and where I started in thinking about it whenever I was intervening um, with folks. So let's talk about for a minute what, what SCARF is and how you can use it. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of research um, about the brain and that how our social behavior is also governed by this idea of minimizing threat and maximizing reward. So we all know we have this approach avoid response as a sort of survival mechanism in our brain that helps us avoid things that we think are threatening and helps us go towards things that, we, that are going to be good for us. Well, it kind of works in a social situation. You know, we thought about it in sort of an environmental where, you know, you might be facing some kind of danger in the environment. But there's also social risks that we are assessing with this kind of circuitry in the brain. So our reaction is going to look similar in a situation that it might in you know, a situation you might consider more uh, dangerous. So, for example, you know, our reaction to that in the environment, right, <laughs> would be sort of, sort of this kind of face, right? We, in a social situation, we see that and we respond. Our brain responds more precisely. And more part of the brain is a similar response. So, we see that. So, Scott builds off of that. So, identified these domains in which this could uh, this could happen. So we have the approach of uh, avoidance response and threats that pre threats in these areas: certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. So let's talk about what those are. Um, let's go through this here. This, so one of the things that um, is important, I think, to remember. You can read this slide later, I suppose, but is that our you know, brain is, is, is seeking pleasure. We're avoiding pain. That's kind of how we're, we're wired. But the threat response seems to be our default response. So ambiguous or, um, you know, we kind of go around with that being ready to be more ready for that to be triggered than the appropriate response, which makes sense, right? Because we need to be more, more attuned to threat rewards so that we uh, survive, for example. So in a social situation, that may also be true, that we may be more looking for 
uh, more easily um, geared in a threat response than an approach response. Things, um, and this goes back to one of the things that um, I mentioned a minute ago. An approach response is also associated with this idea of engagement. You know, it's been around uh, is when there's more positive emotions, interest, joy, desire, those are all approach emotions. Experiencing those positive emotions, and doing more research around this, tend to perceive more options when trying to solve problems. They gain more insight and they collaborate better. Well, I think we, a lot of us have experienced this with ourselves and others, is that we're in a state of mind or a state of feeling where we're feeling more positive, perhaps more relaxed, our ability to problem solve, gain more insight, understand ourselves, understand the world, hurt someone else, goes up tremendously. That's the approach, that's the engagement. So what we're trying to do, right, is encourage those sorts of feelings on how we approach people. So we'll talk about this going green or red in SCAR. Red is away from the threat response and green is toward. So we want to have, help people be green and not red. As you'll see, the red's a little bit bigger. Become, that's the default response, remember. The green is where we want to go, however. So let me just talk about what these terms are. So status refers to someone's sense of importance relative to others. Certain person wants need for clarity and ability to make accurate predictions about the future. The time is tied to a sense of control over their events. Relentless concerns one sense of connection and security with another person. And there, you know, it's a just and non-biased exchange between people. So how can we kind of keep, you know, how can this be triggered? So staff confirming information you can elicit activation, uh, you know, neural activity, we don't get into that, but I don't know if you've ever noticed, but many everyday conversations can just devolve into arguments because of status threat, a desire not perceived as less than another. In our case example, and as you can imagine, probably a number of folks you work with, uh, the environment is, might be telling them this on a more regular basis, you know? Less than. I mean, we get, we all get those messages, actually, right? It's everything is, you know, the, from folks with six-pack abs to, you know, folks with everything else, status. Um, we are somehow less than. That creates that, that, um, that threat. Sometimes giving advice or instructions, simply suggesting that someone is slightly ineffective can be a threat, re threat response. When I was working with clients, this was something that I thought I was being helpful and I would give advice in a gentle way, but it was heard. Remember, uh, the feedback I was getting is it's how you said it. What they were saying was, you know, Give me advice. You're the professional. You think you're better than me. Uh, all sorts of things was what I was saying, but not thinking I was saying. <laughs> so paying attention to uh, that um, helped me understand what might be going on here. So certainty, I mentioned this as well, but different their ability to tolerate this, right? I mean. Some folks do fairly well in uncertain and ambiguous situations where others really struggle if there's even a hint of it. Um, all want certain sense of certainty. That's why these that's why pop music works, quite frankly, because there's this repeating pattern and simple. You know what's coming. There's a certainty. Our brain just says, eat that stuff up. Loves it. Keep in mind, if you can break a complex task into something more manageable than, uh, and with sort of being clear about it, then that helps them with certainty. This was another area that I needed to work on personally, and, and, and this is tough. This is tough. You're dealing with folks that have multiple things going on, big problems. How do you make it manageable so that we can feel not only a sense of success, but we're clear about, you know, what's in front of us? What can we expect? And, you know, no one likes to feel like they don't have control over anything in their environment. And, and many of you are probably working with folks that have lost the sense of control over a lot of stuff and may be exhibiting behaviors 
or do things to try and get that control back. Uh, it might look like other things. When you when you threaten someone's autonomy, um, there's going to be a, a threat response, a reaction. Making choices as, as a sort of self-directed learning or problem solving, having control over one's environment, all help to decrease the threat as much as we can help create that uh, um, perception of the folks. And there was this, people feel greater trust and empathy towards people who are similar to themselves. So again, I, I want that the beginning, I talked about being able to understand this stuff on uh, change for you so that you can understand people are going through change and that even though their changes are different and what they're experiencing is different, we've all struggled with change. So can People feel a connected relatedness to you around around that. Someone who you don't know tends to generate an automatic threat response, and this being linked to trust. Remember, trust one of those influential characteristics. So what can you do? So just sharing some personal aspects, making a connection with someone essentially, and it can be as simple as a handshake, or telling them something about yourself, or just kind of discussing even the weather, because that's something we all have in common, right? And then uh, no one likes to be treated uh, differently or see people being treated differently than you. Um, if someone you think uh, there's different rules for different people, again, triggers a threat response. So one you can work on reducing that is establishing what the expectations are in all situations or working with the person you're working with to help set those expectations and what are the objectives of the work you're doing together. Let them, let this be a partnership. So when using SCARF, this is kind of a model that I use. So I consider what it is I'm going to do and then I ask myself, how, intervention, how might this intervention impact the person across those domains? How might I be producing uh, are creating a threat response across those domains, and how can I decrease that and increase um, the green response? So examples of the difference, hopefully. Uh, let's just take um, try this first, the status, for example. We won't go through them all, but I know that you want to try to live on your own, but that has not exactly worked out well for you, has it? This is, you'll learn a lot about what it takes to live alone, and with just a few supports, could work out well for you. So it's reaffirming that there's something they've learned from their experience, that it's not you just you know, telling them what you think about it and what's fast and judging, and, and the person feels a little judgy, it's about um, maintaining their status that not less than you. And then autonomy, uh, you know, here's what you have to do now versus here are two options that could work. Which, what would what would you prefer? And then I just want to quickly, um, you know, uh, we connect with folks. I mean, this is kind of a, a everything with someone has to kind of make people about this, and it's different probably for different folks you work with. Some of you may have fairly um, sort of standard ways that you, you interact with folks, but you might have some flexibility around that. So. Uh, you know, what you share about yourself is kind of a personal decision, but certainly things like what your favorite color is, that even, as you see, um, that, that's a great shirt you're wearing, or you even tell the person some about you, it's pretty non-threatening, but it's something that, um, you know, they connect with, and I, I bet you that uh, when you have a good relationship with them, that'll come back at some point, and they'll, if they see something green, you know, hey, that's your favorite color, isn't it? Things like that can Uh, we're going to put it together now in a case example. You establish the relationship, you identify where they're at, choose the intentions, and then scarf it. So, okay. Working with a 53-year-old male who was diagnosed with major depressive disorder, recurrent chronic liver disease, and has a long history of alcohol abuse. While he's supposed to be more consistent than not with his medical treatment, he drinks several times a week, often to intoxication, and is inconsistent in addressing his mental health symptoms. With bouts of depression and excessive use of alcohol, has had a difficult time maintaining relationships with others, including his family, and has been fired from numerous jobs. 
driver's license, and other legal involvement related to his alcohol use as well. These experiences and how the environment has reacted to his choices has led to some perception that he is a failure and his problems are just to overcome. This is an experience with support systems in his life as well. Being seen by providers as having poor compliance, quote unquote, he has had difficulty maintaining services and support with almost all of his providers and supports burning bridges with him. This time, for the gentleman, his alcohol use seems to be of primary importance. He doesn't recognize that he has mental health symptoms and has um, and deals with depression and accepts his medical condition as something he needs to deal with. He struggles with seeing his alcohol use as a barrier to his goals. Actually, is it more of a solution than uh, a barrier at this point? And uh, has difficulty seeing how it's contributing to his struggles to feel better and have more of these positive experiences in his life. So you able to establish a good rapport with this, this person, partly because you haven't uh, forced him into the action stage of change around his alcohol use at this point. Um, but his mental status are continuing to decline, and you want to leverage the relationship and the influence that you have built help influence his health choices. So what are some of the things that we can uh, do maybe, or maybe we know, depending on, again, your relationship with the person is that they probably have a heightened threat response around status because they believe that they are a failure, less than others, maybe less than you. They don't seem overwhelming and impossible to solve. Their actions are being taken away one by one. Now they have you involved, so that sort of implicitly uh, implies they need help, right? They are losing relationships and are more isolated, so relatedness. And they think to jump through more hoops now than others because they have these difficult relationships with service providers and are not so willing to be as helpful, maybe, at least for this person's perception as they were before because of some of the uh, things that have happened. So that does not feel fair. Across these domains, there's probably some type of threat response that you might be seeing. So notice you're not at all surprised when they go red. They're not engaging in the, uh, solving their problems in a more collaborative and sort of rational way. So you engage the individual, getting them to partner with you and increase their sense of self-efficacy and confidence so they can actually do something to make them better. So identify that this person is probably in a pre-contemplative state around their alcohol use. So we want to think about what kind of intervention, what sort of interventions might be helpful for someone there. So we decided that the first step might be let's let's them to begin to raise some awareness, maybe in self-monitoring their behavior to make them uh, help them to see the connection, what they know and how it makes them feel and what happens. So let's just start there with the person. Let's get um, Let's get recognizing what might not be working so well and what might be working well. So this intervention would be consciousness raising, perhaps also uh, causing environmental reevaluation if you think about the processes of change. And it connects to behaviors that affect them and their environment. Think, think about how we talk to them about these interventions. These are Here's some examples. Around status. You are expert on you, so I was hoping you could help us figure out what is going on by keeping some sort of record of what happens during your day. I need your help with this, and I think you are the best person to help me. So, I'm not going on and figure out. So, maybe we could start with one day of keeping track and we'll review it. Remember, this is we're on certainty, overwhelmed. How do we break this down? and something that's manageable. But there are a number of ways that this can work that people can keep track. What are ideas? Because I'm really interested in learning about what life looks like from your perspective. I know this might seem like one more thing you're being asked to do, and if it is just too much, we can figure out what makes more sense and feels doable and fair to you. Sometimes folks when dealing with multiple problems, feel like, why do I have to do all, why is it I have to do so much more than everybody else? 
we all seem to have, why do I got to do all this stuff? So, it seems fair to folks, quite frankly. But it is what it is. So how do you engage? Again, it's about engagement. How do you engage in doing something that you think will be more will be helpful to them? So examples of scarfing some of, uh, around um, person um, and monitor. So we up. We are we on time? We're good. We're good. Yeah. Oh. All right. So um, there was a lot there. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that I threw a lot of stuff at you, if, if, especially if you have not heard much about stages of change yet. Um, you got a lot of new stuff. Uh, SCARF, you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, it hasn't always been used uh, in the behavioral health field. It's certainly used a lot in coaching um, and it's used um, in other environments, but, you know, um, business environments, et cetera. But if you, if you read the material and you look at it, it's really about engaging folks in the process of change. I mean, coaching is about change. It's all about um, you get the people either you're working with or other folks in your life to kind of engage with you and move with you. So I, that, to me, um, is very well with um, the work that, that we're doing with folks in behavioral health and uh, substance uh, use is included in that as well in my mind, so behavioral health field. So, um, so it was a lot, and I know it's a lot to kind of put together. It seems like, oh, it's just simple, right? Well, it's not all that simple. It takes practice, but, I, you know, my recommendation, if this is new to you, is to begin to just keep it, like, keep it look for it. See if you think you spot what's going on. Know how people react. Notice how you react. I mean, this stuff, again, is true for you. Scarf is true for you. If I, I, I personally, if whenever I'm in the room with a doctor, I'm going red because I'm feeling that difference in status. So I'm not as creative. I'm not as good at problem solving when I'm in a table with six physicians, for example. It's not them. It's not their fault. It's my reaction to it. So you're going to have similar reactions across all those domains. But see, you spot them not only in uh, your... Uh, you know, if you're working with, but with yourself as well. And then starting there. Okay, so time for questions. But in the in the um, slide deck, you'll see I have some sources if you want to go to the sources for the material that we use today. Uh, uh, read a little more. Um, but low to uh, yeah. We have one question. Um, how much contact do you need to have with someone to facilitate change? Wow. I don't, I don't, I don't know. And I don't know if the research that, that I've read uh, could say specifically. And um, I, for me, I'll just speak for myself and uh, experience. Um, that contact tends to be what I focus on um, when um, maybe how frequently. I think regular contact is important, um, but regular contact, meaning that you're able to be in the person's life in some way on a regular basis, but, um, but the quality of that. So am I, am I meeting the person where they're at? Am I listening? Am I trying to build trust? Are my actions considering? for example, and trying to get them to engage with me. That's kind of more focused. Some, some clinicians, I've, well, I've learned some, from some clinicians that five minutes, the person's engaged. They just, they just have it. I mean, they're warm. They know how to talk to people, people relate to them. They, I mean, it's just amazing. And folks, it takes time to struggle. So it just depends. Sorry, depends is an easy answer, but... <laughs> That's the one question. Um, yes. Still have a couple of minutes. You can. Okay. 
plus durational barrier. Change. Is that a question? Yes. yes. Barriers, barriers to change. change. Just how to think about that question mm -hmm. for a moment. Let me say this, and it's probably not going to be a good answer, but uh, I'm on the spot, so slack. But uh, so there's a lot of ways to think about uh, people change. Um, stages of change, are, you know, we've, I've presented a few today. I think there's a lot of value in looking at, at generations and the culture, if you will, of those generations and how they look at change. Um, uh, for example, uh, I mean, uh, it's almost stereotypical, I guess, but, but um, someone got to find 20 years of experience, and I'm not a young man, but um, someone from my generation, I'm a little less comfortable with some changes than I, I, my daughters are, for example, and they've changed it all the time. It doesn't seem to be as big a deal for them. Something to clarify that um, the person is asking, working with older clients when we're much younger than them. Oh, so the difference in generation between the, the yeah. manager and the, the client. So probably in terms of, um, so think about it in the context of this. I'm, I'm thinking about it in terms of relatedness in particular. So how do you how do you begin to build those connections so that the person feels like you can that they can relate to you and you to them that you understand. So I think it's um, you're not going to do anything about that. It, it, you know. What can you control and what can't you, in my mind? So uh, I can't control our age difference. I can't control different generations. But um, and, yeah. I'm just going to ask. I mean, you spoke a lot about the words and how important the yeah. words are. And when you say, not especially, but given that situation, the words that maybe a younger care manager might use yeah. in serving an older Client um, would be important, right? I think so. I mean, I, it's, it's it's connecting with the person. I, if it was the opposite, you know, for example, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I didn't mention this, but I currently am in. Uh, I also do some private practice uh, as well. And um, when I'm working with your clients, for example, uh, the words I use, not just uh, in terms of scarf, but the, the actual words, the language has to meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think uh, while still being authentic. I mean, if, if I'm going in there yeah. and like, hey, do do this now, nah, nah, you know, and then they're going to think this guy's, you know, <laughs> pretending to be something he's not. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm conscious, I listen to what they say, the words they use, and, and try to use some of those same words if I, if I can, because I think that helps build a connection. But also, I, you know, my feeling is that you have to be authentic. I mean. Uh, regard, you know, not regardless, but you know, um, you know, working with what's going to help them create relatedness and even certainty is you know who you are, right? You know that you are who you are, and when they see you in two weeks, you're going to be who you are, and when you see you, in, you're going to be who you are. The essence of who you are, that you're warm, that you listen, those things. Not, you know, you might change your hair, for example, or something like that. But who you are. I think that cuts across, in my, in my experience anyway, can cut a lot of stuff. Yeah. Don't be any other questions. We have a couple of minutes. Um, you can type in your questions for Doug. So we don't have any other questions, and then feel free, if you have questions, you can send them to us after the presentation has ended, and you will have the PowerPoint deck as well as the attachments for, as for download, or I think those will be sent to you shortly. And please remember to send us name and email addresses if you watched as a group when that survey pops up at the end of the presentation. So thank you for joining us, and we will see you on June 7th for the Learning Collaborative.
Thanks so much. Bye-bye.